Me jätkame rahvusvahelise ühistegevuse konverentsiga. Ja meie järgmine rahvusvaheline esineja räägib siis teemal põlumandus ühistute hetkeolukord Ispaania näitel puu- ja köögivilja sektori näide Anne Koopi näitel. Ja esineja nimi on, nagu ta ise palus ennast nimetada, Pako Porras. Palu! Good evening or morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming and thanks to the organization for inviting me to participate. Tartu and Spain are far in distance, but close in terms of agricultural problems. However, they have, uh, ha sorry, this is in global terms, the evolution of the numbers of Spanish agri-food cooperatives. As you can see, the number of cooperatives has dropped 7% in recent years. But, however, they have grown in turnover over the Spanish average. Therefore, fewer cooperative, but stronger. That is apart from the uh, work from uh, Professor Bigman. <laughs> but I live there because that is the official definition from European Union of cooperatives. Some slides I go quick because the report is here and you can study after. But with, it, with this slide, I focuses on the business on the business performance of a cooperative in the field of agri-food products marketing. There are two business models, cooperatives and private companies. But attending to the previous definition of cooperative according to the European Union, cooperatives are also private companies. No, don't forget. The difference is that the owner's partners are at the same time the product service suppliers who operate under certain regulation previews agreed. In the end, any company, cooperative or private, share the same goals to obtain the highest possible income with the lowest possible expenses in warehouses and picking. But while private companies aim to pay the farmers the lowest possible price, Cooperatives aim to pay the farmers the highest possible price. Why? Because farmers are, at the same time, the owners of the cooperatives. And therefore, they are the ones to reinvest the profit in the business. The aim of first-year cooperative is to enable growers reach together objectives that are impossible, impossible to be reached by them, by them individually. To end, to do together things that is not possible to do alone. Finish. If we speak about second tier cooperative, it's exactly the same. And don't forget that the constant concentration of demand by concentration or large distribution chains make many first years cooperative too small. And then, that's exactly the same. I apologize now, 
because I did not know the program today until Monday. I have dated to talk a little about cereals and dairy products when I see that in this forum there are real specialists, sorry for the dating. But to have one idea about Estonia, <laughs> I see one approach to the situation of agricultural production around the Baltic Sea regarding cereals, dairy, and fruit and vegetable sector. The following date are having been obtained out of the great study made from the European Union by the University of Wageningen under the title Support for Farmers' Cooperatives. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Bigman. In all three slides, on the left chart, I have taken in consideration three key date per country. The blue column, column indicates the total output per farm registered. The red line indicates the average surface in hectare of each farm. And the figure above, don't go. The figure above, um, the output per hectare. But I go quick because that is uh, for your study after. But this chart includes a list of the cooperative from these six countries per sector. In this case, is the cereal. When we uh, allow here the uh, dairy sector, hmm? uh, I put also the cooperatives, and we see that there is uh, five cooperatives from uh, Estonia, eh? and we see also the other cooperative. One cooperative, I think, speak after here, eh? but it's a cooperative that, uh, for my information has some operation in Russia. And also for fruit vegetables that where there is a big difference between uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, and Finland with these countries. And we do the same. Okay. And last from this report is the performance of the market share of the cooperatives in this uh, six countries. Mm? You can after study. Mm? And the last that I present for you is from the University of Tartu. Is that, that is a study from the University of von, von Tartu. Is uh, the professor Andro Ross. Mm? And I found this information that for me was one surprise. That that's was the position of cooperative in 1939. That I found really very, very interesting. Finally, I speak about Anicop. <laughs> okay, first of all, I speak about one cooperative from Anicop, one first year cooperative. How has cooperative movement developed in Spain? Taking into account that a small and medium-sized farmers were majority in the country. In the case of Canso, it's similar as that of some many others cooperatives in the beginning of the 20th century. There were two social trends, progressive and conservative. Progressive Republican, conservative Catholic. After the end of Spanish Civil War, most of cooperatives mer merged. 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 Thus, losing any kind of political connotation, and that was cancel. That was in the beginning, already in the beginning, in the in the middle of the century, the export from oranges, that is, that's, was oranges, some oranges for here, for these countries. Yeah. And that is already in the uh, 70s, 
in the, in the middle of the 20th century, and that is a photo from the middle of 70s. And what was happened in the middle of 80s, coinciding with the political change in Spain, in Spain from dictatorship to democracy, many first-tier cooperatives considered the need to organize themselves into second-tier cooperatives. Due to the reason I explained it earlier, does Canso participate in the foundation of three of the most important second-tier cooperatives in Spain? Banco de Crédito Cooperativo, which groups are provide banking services to, to local credit cooperatives, such as the Caja Rural de la Alcudia Head Cartier of Canso. Coarval, the first cooperative in Spain in fertilizers, phytosanitary and products and fuels. And also Anecop, <coughs> for fruit and vegetable marketing. In the three cooperatives, Canso has a very active participation and this usually present in the governing boards with a representative. That's uh, early this century. In the following charts, you can see the evolution during the last years of the cooperative, both in volume and the next in turnover. But at this point, an important detail, 70,000 tons of fruit and vegetables is quite correct for a store. But if you think that Canso has about 1,300 uh, producing partners, members, the average is only 54 tons per member. And we are talking about small and medium farmers. Here you see the, the turnover. Now is around 30. In this year, last year was 35 million. But don't forget 1,300 farmers who intervene democratically in the government of the cooperative. And sometimes it's not pleasant. Anecop. Anecop is an example of second tier cooperative. Anecop is a cooperative of cooperatives made up of 69 members cops which represent the interest of nearly 27,000 farmers all over Spain. The origin. At the beginning of the 70s, purchase of citrus from Eastern countries were state contracts, only one contract per country, and were controlled in this time in Spain by the aristocracy of private exporter. And was, that was one from the main reason to begin an ECOP. Also, that's the founders things to consolidate cooperative supply in produce, diversify the offer by increasing of variety of products marketers and by extending product season. You must think that in this time in Spain was not a, a modern distribution, but in Europe were. And then to bar gain bargaining power when dealing with large scale distribution chains. But that was, in the beginning, the reason was that. 
that's the new mission and vision that I uh, leave for you to study after because I think that is an interesting uh, uh, analyze, but is you can study after. That is the structure now from Anecop with what do for his members extra the commercialization with logistic services, with quality, with traceability, with codification, research and development that we, we are going after to see, and marketing in general. Developing our global, uh, global certification for small and medium sizes, uh, farmers, and also for the uh, uh, organic crop. In this chart, we can see where ANECOP's members are located. Please notice that ANECOP offers come from the main agricultural production areas in the countries and from complete different mentalities from the countries. Hmm? Has nothing to do Catalonia, Valencia, Murcia, Andalusia, Occidental and Oriental, and Central Spain. I guarantee you, nothing to do. In this chart, you can see the sales development of the cooperative by group of products. Citrus, vegetables, fruit, and wines. In the end, what started as an uncertain initiative of small and medium farmers grouped in small and medium first-year cooperative has turned in, into the first trading company and the biggest exporter of wheat and vegetables of Spain. I guarantee you that this old are in export aristocracy private don't uh, realize, don't think that that was, was possible. We also don't know. It is interesting to observe the monthly sales throughout the year, the combination of the different campaigns of the cooperatives in the corresponding production areas, allow to maintain agreed marketing activity throughout the year. This, facilit this facilitates relation with end customers as well as a constant activity of our sales structures. Governing bodies. Here we have the governing structure of the cooperative. The members of the board are elected for four years, but every two years, half of the board change. The number of votes of each cooperative is directly related to the sales made through ANECOP, not one cooperative, one vote. All production areas are represented in the governing board. Naturally, an assembly of 69 members is less numerous than the assembly of council with 1,300. But if we think that the average turnover of cooperatives through ANECOP is close to million euro, the discussion can also be complicated. In 
In this diagram, we can see the evolution of ANECOP sales structure. Above the sales office and companies in Spain, and below the international sales structure. You see also that in the beginning, ANECOP has one ADN to export. In fact, in the beginning from ANECOP, uh, his founders uh, forbidden sale in the domestic market. Ten years later, uh, was possible, but in the beginning, no. Agriconsa is one factory for uh, uh, juice of citrus and uh, mandarina segment uh, to to uh, concert. concert. That's at the offices and also the st our structure, Aneco Polska, Aneco Praga, developed after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall. That's office in Spain. Foundation Anecop, is a structure in Holland. Foundation Anecop together with the University of Almeria, I explain after. Agricop, structure from Anecop in Moscow. <coughs> Anecop is here with other color because <coughs> that is only developed for wine in Hong Kong. And also uh, Solagora. Solagora is that we have developed to have one organic image. Because there is organic uh, thinkers, organic uh, people that think that's connected between conventional and organic can contaminate. Okay, don't, don't worry. We do one company extra only for organic, Solagora. It's no problem. And uh, Tropical Direct, quite the same, because in England, the uh, retailers uh, put one etiquette, one label for the company. This company is specialized in citrus, specialized, okay, say we, we want to do a specialist in Tropical. Then we, as Anecop, do a Tropical Direct, specialist in Tropical. Don't worry. And to end, two things. Uh, Janus fruit, two new uh, products for ready to eat fruit, salad fruit, and all these kind of things. We see the photo after. <laughs> and uh, Exoticos del Sur, that is to, you know, not, not only because the, the climate change, but it's clear that Spain is the unique uh, country from Europe that we have tropical areas in Almeria and Malaga. You know because you're holidays, but it's very tropical. And Dort, we have developed new plantation from mango, from chirimoya. Chirimoya is already known, but also from uh, papaya. And then to develop that, we have done exoticos del sur. That is the structure from, from uh, the, the, the photo, eh? okay. This is the impact of our export, very small. As you can see, Anecop account for an average 5% of total Spanish export of fruit and vegetables. But don't forget that Spain, the leader of total export from fruit of vegetable, of vegetables in the world, export 14 million tons from fruit and vegetables. With 5%, we are the first, and the second company is less as 2%. Very small in market share, but that is the... Okay. Like as you say, in fruit and vegetables, our main destination is Europe market. Eh? That is uh, normal for this kind of products. If we see in names from countries, we see that France, Spain, of course, Germany, then Italy, Poland, ba, 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 ba. we are selling here in Estonia for Maxima, 
for uh, uh, Prisma, for uh, uh, Rimi, is normal. Uh, uh, sure, you have uh, it from us, mainly Persimmon, sure, sure. Curious, that's for uh, the wine in Anecop is only 5% from our turnover, but with 35 million for uh, bottled, bottled wine, it's not bad, but you can see that the destination is completely different because it's another, another uh, business and interesting that Russia, naturally, for alcohol, is not possible to organize a ban. That is the first foundation and foundation for research and development. It's located in Valencia, 20 minutes from the head office, and it contains one of Spain's most important varietal collection for new varieties in citrus, stone fruits, khaki, grape, grape without, grapes without pips, pomegranate, etc and also the laboratory for mildew residues, pesticide analyzed, etc. This other uh, foundation, together with the University of Almeria, is to we test new varieties of fruit and vegetables, as well as new growing system under different greenhouse condition only from plastic or nets, without, not, not plastic, nets, plastic, a little plastic better than after till heating. Five difference. But for me, the most important is Naturane. But why Naturane? Because when Global Gap was developed to reference uh, plantation was thought to big plantation. And Spain, the majority are small plantation. And Naturane was the first system to uh, reference small and medium plantation. That was the, uh, we can say, that is the, the value from Naturane. Naturane is from Aneco, and that is a special system, but was the first, we say, global gap two is the name, but that is because it's not possible. You must think that, for instance, in, in my cooperative, where I am uh, a son of, uh, of one farmer, I am today a member, the average from the, our plantation are less as half hectare. Can you imagine, uh, the, my cooperative is close from Canso, uh, and uh, has around more or less the same level of, of, of tons, 70, 75,000 tons. Can you imagine how many uh, farm uh, plantation you need with half hectare to do this quantity of product? It's okay, the time? Okay. In this second diagram, we can see how the different products that integrate an eco portfolio have been introduced over time. The beginning citrus, quick some vegetables, then some fruit, then some wine, but only bulk in the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah? Only bulk in the beginning. The watermelon seedless, I explain a bit, little bit after. Yeah? the uh, wine bottled, the persimmon, the structure from Bouquet Bio for the organic, one variety that belong to Anecop, the Paraguayos, eh, the kiwis from Valencia, eh, grown in Valencia, eh, and all the exotic, plus the Janus product. In this case, I, I tell you that watermelon seedless and persimmon, that was product developed from Anecop. Don't exist before Anecop. 
Eh? And also, uh, kiwi in Valencia was planted from Anecop, developed first of all in the, in the foundation, after translate to the, to the farmer, and also the ideas from uh, the uh, Easy de Bouquet, the Janus. Okay, only one detail about this. The, the seed was the seed to, because to plant does you need seed. Eh? The result is without seed, but you need seed. The seed was not developed from Anecop. The seed was from, developed from Pioneer in 1975, but found not the system to introduce. The, the work from Anecop was to introduce 16 years later as Pioneer has developed, because it was not too easy to found, but we have developed, and the result is that today in Europe, from Spain, the quantity from watermelon seedless is really big. And in Anecop, last uh, year represented 123,000 tons. And the other product was the khaki of persimmon. The khaki of persimmon, as you know here, because uh, in the former Russia, he was khaki from Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan, small, soft, and brown. And as we have developed, is that we have, we have copy from the Israel uh, system with his Sharons and with this, with the variety that we have, that the variety that we have, uh, we have 40 years, and 20 years ago, we have developed, but we can eat only soft, like the Uzbekistan uh, khaki. And we have developed the system that you can eat like one peach or like one mango. Then, from this reason, we have developed this uh, revolutionary evolution, because uh, uh, this year, the production in Spain was around 400,000 tons, and Anecop control from this quantity, 40, 43% from the, because the product was developed for Anecop, but when we begin that, I don't know that was possible to register. And, sorry. Okay. Other histories? Other histories? Yeah, other histories that we are always in these questions, all that. And that is that I explained you about the Janus wheat, where we have developed not only these um, sticks from carrots, but with the sauce or the sticks from celery or the mix from different fruit, also with some hummus, hummus or some, uh, all these kind of things that now all people try to buy in the convenience uh, shops close from the university or close from the central city or all these things. Eh? Okay, and finally, naturally we have our, our we have our, our uh, market strategy to present in conference, but the reality is that to end, we do a lot of uh, private label because the strength from the uh, uh, distribution is so big that to end, we do a lot of private label. With the products that, are, that we can resist we resist and we invest, but the strength from the, from the, from the uh, distribution is really too big. To end, some conclusion for you, special for the farmers. No farmer from Lalcudia, is the, the town where is cancelled, even the big ones will have a ever been able to become 
or represent what Anekop does. Never. And no one of Anekop's member cooperatives, even the big ones, would have even able to become or represent what Anekop does. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, you were very well in time, <coughs> and now we have possibility to ask a uh, few questions. I will start. You mentioned one very interesting fact for me, and it was about that uh, not always one member means one vote, but, one, but votes are depending about your sales in cooperative. How members can accept this system. Can you comment this a bit? Uh, in Anecop, that was easy for the beginning. In Anecop, was very easy. And um, the, the structure from the beginning remained more or less. And uh, is more or less uh, every 300,000 uh, euro is one vote. That is more or less the structure. Mm -hmm. But in the cooperative from first year, like my cooperatives, we have one system not exactly the same. The system is another. The system is that if one uh, member of cooperative uh, in, 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 in my town eh, is producer, is uh, uh, use the uh, bank credit, use the fuel tank, and use the uh, fertilized uh, supply warehouse can have maximal four votes. Mm. If you use only one thing, one in this structure. That's, I say, in cooperative from first year. I must say that in Spain, I don't know one cooperative from first year that has maximal one one uh, uh, difference between one to four, one to four. That is in one cooperative from first tier. Second tier, in Anecop, there is, in Spain, there is um, some, and all has one structure from bots in relationship with the, with the, with the sales. In first degree, in, in first here in Spain, I know maximal this one or mark of fear. But ca can it happen that if you have no sales some year, you have no votes also? Yes. Hmm. Yes. Yes, because, for instance, I told you, in my home, we, are, we live three persons. Only one has fields. The other two use the cooperative from different things, for, for different uh, questions. But in the moment that we bought it in the cooperative, only myself, I have four, the other three person has only one. Mm -hmm. That is in the culture, we can say. Nii, palun tõste käsi saalist, kes soovib esitada küsimust nüüd. Meil on see võimalus. Ja kui käsi tõuseb, siis tuleb kohe mikrofon. Kes soovib küsida? Palun. Eesti keeles saab küsida. Käsi ei tõusnud. Täna me meie esinejad Pako Korraasi ja ka temale tore kingitus Eestist. Suurelt teha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Meie Rahvusvahelise esinejate blokki lõpetame teemaga Iirimaalt. Kuidas töötab ühistuline mudel Iirima piimanduses? Päris suvitav teema ja seda esitab meile täna Thomas Joseph Flaningen. Please. Thank you uh, and thanks for the, uh, for the invitation here to speak to you. Um, 
I guess I was asked to talk about how the cooperative model works for dairy in Ireland, so I'll try to speak about that. Um, I'm not coming here with all the answers. Um, sometimes I have more questions than answers, but uh, we have some experience and, and my organization next year will be 125 years old. So we'll have been 125 years learning and 125 years making mistakes uh, and sometimes doing things right. Um, just so you understand, I'm from Ireland. Um, Eric Michaels was talking earlier, and he talked about he had a lovely graph that showed a picture that showed how small um, or how big Canada was relative to the countries that you're familiar with. Um, Ireland is a lot closer in size. Um, I just did a quick Google search there earlier, and I, I see that uh, Ireland, the island is 84,000 square kilometres compared to 45 for Estonia. So um, we're not quite twice the size of Estonia, and that's, that's the island of Ireland. Um, just a little bit of background on ICOS. Um, we represent about 130 cooperative businesses and organizations in Ireland. Um, they're mostly in the agriculture or rural sphere. Um, you may recognize some of the names up there, you may not. Some of them are dairy cooperatives, some of them are livestock cooperatives, some of them are farm services cooperatives. So there's about 130 of them. Um, out of interest, there are about a thousand cooperatives registered in Ireland, um, but very many of them are very small little businesses. Um, but we re would represent directly about 130 of the largest of them. Um, just to understand the, the, the uh, level of control that the cooperatives have in the different sectors, um, in Ireland, cooperatives or, or, or businesses owned by cooperatives would control about 98% uh, of the dairy business. Um, they would control about 65% of the grain business, um, about 60% of the farm inputs business, uh, and about 60% of li the livestock trading business. So cooperatives are pretty dominant in the areas that they operate in. Um, I mentioned that they controlled about 65% of the grain business, the cereal business, but there aren't actually any cereal cooperatives up here. Uh, it's just that some of our dairy cooperatives, like Dairy Gold there, or Glanbia, uh, or North Cork, or some of the others, they also purchase grain as well. So they're, we call them dairy cooperatives, but they purchase grain, cereals, barley, wheat, oats from farmers, um, sell the inputs, and manufacture them into, into animal feed. This is ICOS. We are based in, in uh, the, right in the centre of Dublin, uh, and we provide, there's about 15 people within ICOS, about 15 staff, and we provide professional services to our members. And the first thing that we provide them is, we provide them with is a rule book. So it's like a constitution in a company. So every cooperative uh, that's a member of ICOS has an ICOS rule book, uh, and they need to get our, um, we provide them with the legal advice on the drafting and amending of the rule book and they need to get our authority if they want to change their rules. Uh, so we provide some coordination and protect the interests of members, which is very important. Um, so I don't want to repeat what was said earlier, what is a cooperative? Um, and I guess there are some academic, uh, well, first of all, is, you know, it comes from the Latin to work together. Um, here's, the, I guess, the academic definition. Um, but you'll notice a comment here that it says, um, on the basis of one member, one vote principle. Um, in Irish cooperative law, actually, you don't have to have one member, one vote. So to be a cooperative in Ireland, you can have a vote pro rata to the level of business that you do, but not if you're an ICOS cooperative. So I've mentioned that all our members have ICOS rules, and in ICOS rules, it must be one member, one vote for a primary cooperative. We have some secondary cooperatives as well, like Paco mentioned, which are cooperatives of cooperatives, and they can have weighted voting. So if you have one of our cooperatives, actually, it's, 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 it's four smaller dairy cooperatives own a larger dairy cooperative, and the votes of the four small dairy cooperatives are weighted to the size of the, the, the volume of milk that they provide. 
So that's the only scenario where we have voting weighted to the level of business that you do in, for a secondary co-op. But for a farmer cooperative, it's one member, one vote. If you have 30 cows or you have 300 cows at a general meeting, you have one vote. Uh, I guess the, probably the more, the more important piece, though, that we would find for a cooperative is that notwithstanding the fact that a cooperative is about democracy and member ownership and control, it's also really just another type of corporate entity. It's like a company. It's not a company, but it's like one. Um, and it's designed ultimately to limit the liability of members, to protect them, to give limited liability and allow them to take risks. Because if they don't take risks, then society doesn't grow. So it must be run as a business sustainably and profitably, otherwise it won't survive and it needs good governance. Uh, and that's always the challenge in cooperatives because they're democratic societies, one member, one vote, people get elected onto the board. And sometimes, just like in your parliaments, the people who get elected are the most popular people, or the most popular people get elected. That doesn't necessarily mean they're the best people to direct the business. It doesn't mean that they're the people who will take the best decisions, but they're the most popular people. So that's always a challenge in cooperatives, just like it is in governance, um, to make sure that we have good decisions. So what does a cooperative mean in dairy? Um, fundamentally, it's about collaboration, cooperation, pooling of resources to collect, process, and market in milk. Why? Because milk processing facilities are expensive. Stainless steel is very, very expensive. Um, farmers on their own can't face the, the market, can't reach the market. One individual farmer could probably pasteurize and package some milk for the local town of 1,000 people but they can't go to China with their products, they can't go to Africa with their products. So that's why you need a cooperative to allow you to do that in a way that it gives you some control. And farmers, dairy farmers particularly, can't constantly negotiate conditions with third parties. There's an interesting story from Ireland about why we have 98% cooperatives at 98% of the dairy business, 65% of the grain, and 0% of the beef processing business and 0% of the pig processing business, but particularly they have no control whatsoever or no business within beef processing. 35 years ago, cooperatives controlled the majority of the beef processing in Ireland, uh, but now they have no beef business. So there is an argument or there's a question to be asked, why don't cooperatives or why didn't cooperatives survive in the beef business when they've survived in the dairy business? And maybe one of the arguments is that, well, dairy farmers need somebody to send a truck in through their gate every day or every two days to collect the milk um, because the dairy farmer just can't afford to be on the phone every day trying to negotiate milk price. Whereas with beef, if somebody has some cattle to sell, they, might, they maybe sell some cattle two or three times a year. They can do a different deal three or four times in the year depending on what the prices are. So the cooperatives just don't fit that niche as well. Um, so cooperation with other farmers, certainly in dairy, it, it certainly makes sense. Um, because again, in dairy, the farmer's number one job is milking cows, investing in milking facilities, new technologies, expanding, um, putting that milk into the bulk tank, which is the important piece. But somebody else has to own the next process, collecting that milk out of the bulk tank, putting in place the millions um, uh, to buy the stainless steel to expand um, and ultimately to get it to the market whether it's in China or anywhere else. In Ireland, we've had, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but we've had some pretty dramatic expansion in our milk supply um, since the ending of milk quotas. Uh, and in that period, there's been about a billion euros spent, approximately a billion euros spent on facilities on this expensive looking stainless steel in order so that the farmers can, can, can realize their ambitions. Um, and, and they wouldn't have been in a position to do that themselves. So that the model works. The model has provided that funding as long as farmers are willing to contribute. I'll just give you a little bit of brief history about, again, that we have 125 years of mistakes, but so you might understand where we came from. Um, we like to think we're in a pretty good position at the moment, but we weren't always. Um, so Ireland was a, was, a, was, a, was a poor country. 
some, some ways we still are a poor country, um, but our history in dairy, um, particularly in the 1800s, we've had about 800 years of being ruled by the British, uh, and that was a difficult time in Ireland. Um, particularly the 1800s was a very difficult time where we had a series of famines uh, and our population went from 8 million over a period of about 15 years down to about 4 million for the entire island. Um, so the population halved. So we were in a very poor way due to famine and, em and emigration. Um, farms were very small, people were very poor. We had a traditional business of su supplying butter to Britain and to the British Empire. Um, and these were individuals who had one cow milking that cow, um, churning the butter at home manually and somehow trying to get into a supply chain to export product across the world. So therefore, you know, they weren't in a strong position. There were issues with quality because individual farmers making butter in a wooden churn, um, perhaps the technology wasn't great and perhaps the hygiene wasn't brilliant. So we started to get surpassed uh, in other markets. So in the British market, the Danes started to organize themselves a little bit and they started to, to, to push the Irish out of the British market. Um, and also there were new technologies emerging. So De Laval, the De Laval steam separator um, was introduced in Sweden and that just brought Sweden and the Nordic countries so much further ahead and we were being left behind and something needed to be done to move a dairy industry from hundreds of thousands of people, each, each one with one of these things, uh, to a position where we could export. And that's the, that was our conduit to the world market back in the 1800s. That's the Cork, the Cork butter market, and our butter was exported in these barrels to the Caribbean and India and everywhere else that the British, um, the parts of the world that the British used to rule. Um, just a little bit of history on ourselves. ICUS was founded by uh, a guy called Horace Plunkett. Uh, he was a unionist, so when he was a young man, he's, he supported the union with the United Kingdom. He didn't believe in an independent Ireland. He changed his mind later. He was a landowner, so he owned a lot of land, and he was a businessman. But from, well, in his young life, he, uh, he had asthma, and he had lung problems, and the wet, damp air in Ireland didn't suit him, so he went as a young man to Wyoming in the United States, and he started ranching, and he became very wealthy. Um, then he came back to Ireland, saw how poor the people were in Ireland, and uh, decided he'd help them. So he, from 1889 onwards, he started to establish cooperative creameries, so small local creameries. Uh, and in 1894, he founded the IAOS, the Irish Agricultural Organisation Society, which is the, which ICOS um, evolved out of. Um, and that's what those creameries looked like in the, in the early days, probably very similar to what they looked like in Estonian history as well, and that's a, more, that's a version from the 1930s. But just so you can understand again our history, which has been difficult, um, full of mistakes, um, and not, not at all smooth, um, when, when the creameries were set up first, by 1914 there were about 1,000 cooperatives uh, and nearly 90,000 members. So at every small little rural area, there was a, a cooperative creamery, um, uh, and each one with, I guess, an average of about 90 members. Um, and that's what the country looked like at the time. These things were dotted everywhere, um, geographically more so in the southwest and this part of the north, because that's what the soil was suited for at the time. So the farms down here were suited to dairying. They were smallish farms. And here there were smallish farms. Over here the farms were too, too small and the soil was too difficult, so no dairying. And all along here and up along this eastern coast, the farms were too big and the farmers were too wealthy. They weren't bothered milking cows. They could grow arable crops and have sheep and things. So these were the farmers that were probably small enough that they could have one or two cows um, and had reasonable soil and they, and they owned their land. But there were difficult times in rural Ireland. Um, we had a war of independence from the British, which really started about 1916 and finished about 1921. Uh, when we finished our war of independence and we achieved independence, we decided that we'd have a civil war uh, because we were so happy fighting with the British, we said we'd fight ourselves. Uh, and very many, that was a difficult time because when we had a civil war and we achieved our independence from Britain, we then had an economic war with Britain. We fell out with them. It was like Brexit way back when. 
Um, and at the time, the Irish, the, the British banned all imports from Ireland, and Ireland banned all imports from Britain. And they were our nearest neighbour and our traditional trading partner, and we couldn't export to them. And they refused to import from us. Um, so very many of our cooperatives failed uh, because the British market was closed. Um, and actually in 1927, we, we achieved properly our independence in 1922, but in 1927, the state, the government at the time, the new government, which was only five years old, set up a company, a state enterprise, to rescue all the creameries that had actually failed. They had gone broke because they had no markets. So the, the new government, one of the first things it did was it set up a company called the Dairy Disposal Company, um, which purchased all the creameries which had failed and undertook to run them until they could be re-merged back into cooperatives again. And in some cases, that took 50 years. Um, so we had a slow, painful evolution until the 1970s when we prepared for entry into the EEC. So uh, the only reason I show you these, this picture and, and go through this story is to show you that um, whilst I have some understanding of where you're coming from on the cooperative side and why there are challenges in establishing cooperatives and it's, it's not easy, and I don't think the human's instinct is to cooperate. I think all of us as humans, our instinct is to be independent. But sometimes you do have to cooperate. And I think we've learned that over 125 years in a very messy way, in a very expensive way. But we finally are happy now, I think, that the model does work. Um, so we're the ultimate slow learners, but I think we're sure now. Um, so anyway, from the 1970s, when we joined the EEC um, in 1973, our cooperative started to invest in technology. Prior to that, the very traditional dairy model was farmers brought their milk to a creamery. The cream was churned, made into butter, and the farmer took home the skim milk and it was fed to pigs. And that model existed from the 1890s up until the early 1970s. And it's only from the 1970s onwards that the new technology uh, around drying um, was introduced. From the time we joined the EEC, at the t as it was, until 1983, we doubled our milk volume. So we had a 100% increase in volume from 73 to 83. And we were on a growing trajectory, and we were very happy. We thought we were going to take over the world. And then milk quotas were introduced in 1984, and suddenly we had to stop. Uh, and as a result, we had stagnation in, in, in milk volume for 30 years. Um, so we had, our cooperatives had, many of them had merged and become more sophisticated, more efficient businesses, and they were ready to, you know, produce more and more milk and next thing, milk quotas. Um, and that was devastating for many of the co-ops. So they, a lot of them evolved into other businesses. They got involved in pigs, in agribusiness, in consumer foods, lots of other businesses because the milk business was stagnating. Just a little bit of background on the, on the dairy industry. Um, we have a total milk production in the Republic of Ireland of about 7 billion litres. Um, if you add Northern Ireland, which is the, the northern quarter of the island, maybe it's one-fifth of the island, Northern Ireland, they have, a, they have 2 billion litres. So we have an all-Ireland dairy economy. Milk flows north and south. There's no border in the dairy business. So in total, there's about 9 billion litres of milk on the island. Um, but of our 7 billion litres, only 7% is liquid. So there's 4.7 million people in the Republic of Ireland. We can't drink 7 billion litres. So we drink about 500 million litres, which is a lot of milk. Um, but the rest of it has to be processed. Um, about 98% of milk is purchased by cooperatives. Uh, our companies related to cooperatives, owned or related to cooperatives. Um, we've 10 milk processors, which are either co-ops or are owned by co-ops. Um, we have, an, we have an additional 12 other, other cooperatives which purchase milk, um, but very, very many of those are actually shareholders in the bigger cooperatives. Some of the bigger cooperatives, um, one of them is a secondary cooperative, and, and probably three others have share, amongst their shareholders, so most of their shareholders are ordinary members, but some of their, mem some of their shareholders are small cooperatives. So that's why we have 10 processors and 12 other cooperatives, some of whom are shareholders in, in the processing cooperatives. Uh, and most of our cooperatives are multi-purpose, so they're doing other things other than processing milk. They are 
purchasing grain, they're manufacturing feed, selling fertilizer, selling hardware, um, selling fuel, farm requisites, etc. Some of them have wind farms. One of them owns a hotel in Berlin. They do lots of different things. Um, and the business, the dairy business, is, is, is a three billion euro business. Uh, just again, so you understand sort of the island and where it is, um, that's a clear day. Uh, we nearly, r rarely get clear days, but the satellite flew over on that clear day. Um, so just so you understand, and I'll talk a little bit later on about Brexit, uh, but the border between, North, this is Northern Ireland here, and the border between Northern Ireland uh, and the Republic of Ireland is a very, very, very twisty line that goes up and down here through lakes. It goes back up down here and back around here again. Um, so that's the entire island of Ireland. These are the, these are the cooperatives. Um, this is Glanbia. This is the biggest one. This purchases about 2.5 billion litres of milk, so it's a, it's, a big, it's a big company in Ireland. It also owns a big share in Glanbia PLC, which is a public company, which is, which is the biggest manufacturer of cheese in the US. But that's a, di a different company within the Glanbia family. So that's the biggest entity. The second biggest cooperative is this one now, Lakeland. Um, it used to be the fourth biggest, but uh, about a month ago it merged with this one and is, take, is taking this one over. So now it'll have about 1.8 billion litres. Um, then both of these, uh, Kerry's Irish Business and Dairy Gold, each one purchases about 1.3 billion litres each. And then all the rest of them all do other, you know, purchase between 300 million and 7 or 800 million between them or each. Uh, and this cooperative up here, this isn't a member of ICOS. This is Dale Farm. This is a Northern Ireland registered cooperative that purchases about half the milk in Northern Ireland. So this isn't a member of ICOS. It's registered under British rules. Um, but cooperatives in the south, as well as purchasing all 98% of the milk in the Republic of Ireland, they also purchase about half the milk that's produced in Northern Ireland. Uh, the other half is bought by this cooperative. So just, just so you understand the dynamic of what's happening there, just so you understand where our milk business is, um, again, in the Republic of Ireland, we'll be producing about seven, something over 7 billion litres this year. With some growth, we expect growth of probably 2% this year. Uh, we had a really horrible spring, uh, a really wet spring, and then a really cold spring, and then we had a really hot and dry summer. Um, so the grass wasn't growing, and we were very dependent on grass. Um, so we would have been growing by 6 or 7% every year, but this year we'll probably just grow by 2%. Uh, we've had a 50% increase in milk supply since the milk quotas ended in 2015. Uh, we have about 700 or 17,000 dairy farmers, uh, each producing about 400,000 litres each. So there's an average of about 80 cows. So that's 80 cows producing 5,000 litres each. That's sort of the typical Irish dairy farm. 90% um, of the milk is produced on spring calving herds, so we have very seasonal milk supply. So 90% of our milk comes from spring calving herds. So the cows are typically dried off from now onwards, and will, so there'll be no milk produced until probably the 1st of February. So the cows will be dry, so the farmers can have Christmas off. Um, and that's our traditional model. There's about 10% of the milk is produced in year-round calving herds, so the calves in those herds, cows calve in the autumn and in the spring. Uh, and those herds supply the local, domestic, the local liquid milk market and some, some small markets for, that need year-round milk. But 90% of our milk is, is very, very seasonal. And 90% of our production is exported because we only have 4.7 million people. So this is our production. It's very, very seasonal. So we produce uh, in the peak months well, this is how our, our production has grown in the last number of years. So this is from 2000 up to 2017, um, and this is our monthly supply. So in the, in, in the months of May and June, we're, we're very, very busy, and in the months of December and January, there's not much milk. There's only this amount of milk needed, which, which really supplies drinking milk markets and some people who want to make ice cream and, and, and some speciality business. The vast majority of dairy farmers produce no milk in the wintertime but they produce a lot of milk in the middle of the summer. So that affects how we do our business. It means we have to invest in, in stainless steel and facilities for the busiest day in the year. So the busiest month, we produce a billion litres, and the quietest month, we produce 140 million litres. 
but 40 of that 140 is for drinking milk. So there's only 100 million litres for manufacturing in December and January. So 100, and there's a billion, 100 million these months, these two months, and a billion this month. So you need a factory that's big enough to process a billion litres a month, um, but sometimes it only gets a million or, or, or 100 million or 200 million. So it does make the industry uh, less efficient in some ways, in terms of capital employed, but it makes the farmers a lot more efficient uh, because they can produce off grass. So what do we make? Um, about 60% of our, of our milk um, actually gets diverted, 62% of our milk gets turned into butter, and this is our main butter brand, the Kerrygold brand, which is, I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, the Kerrygold brand is owned by Ornua, which is a secondary cooperative, which nine of the ten processors own. Um, so 60% of our milk, 60, over 60% of our milk gets used to make this butter. It's the number one butter in Germany. It's the number, number one imported butter in the US. Um, it's a very valuable brand. Uh, and, and the Kerrygold brand has sales of about a billion euros. So it's a billion euro brand. So anybody who's in the, the corporate world, a billion euro brand or a brand with a billion euro in sales is always a valuable brand. About 25 or 6% of our milk gets used to make cheese. Now because we're, our next door neighbors are the UK and because we're a former British colony, uh, the cheese that we mostly make is cheddar cheese because that's what the British like. Uh, and we export most of our cheese to Britain. Um, so it's, it's a bit unfortunate when Brexit is coming because if we lose the British market, um, it's not much fun trying to sell 200,000 tonnes of cheddar cheese in other countries that don't like cheddar cheese. So that will be a challenge. Uh, so we, we hope for a good Brexit deal. Uh, otherwise, we're, um, we could be trying to sell cheddar cheese in Estonia um, very cheaply. Um, <laughs> The other products that we sell, obviously we make a lot of milk powder, um, so we make about 500,000 tonnes, closer to 600,000 tonnes of milk powder, all the various types of powders from skim milk powder, whole milk powder, fat filled powder and all the various types of um, whey powders. And now increasingly infant formula is, is, is a big part of our business um, and that's mostly going to China, which is very important to Ireland right now. It's very important to everywhere, but to us particularly. And we just hope that uh, the Chinese market stays as strong as it has been. Uh, to understand the routes to market that we use, this is an interesting story. So Ornua is our number one route to market. Uh, Ornua is it's a Gaelic word, um, which means or it's actually probably similar in lots of languages, it means gold. And Nua means new, so new gold is what the, the name of the, it's a, it's a secondary cooperative. So actually it's got about 41 shareholders, lots of different, some of which are cooperatives that are no longer processing milk. But the nine big dairy processing cooperatives uh, are the majority shareholders in our Nua. And they turn over about two and a half billion euros. So they're our main route to market for all our cooperatives. Remember 90% of our product has to leave the country. Um, so there, it doesn't make sense to have 10 different sales teams going to China or 10 different sales teams going to the US or West Africa. It makes sense to put them all on the one team. Uh, so for most of our butter and cheese, um, it's, all, it's, it's marketed through Ornua. They have two businesses. One is Ornua Foods, which sells butter and cheese under the Kerrygold brand. And the second business is Ornua Ingredients, which sells food ingredients. Um, the second route to market that we have is where individual cooperatives or companies have marketing subsidiaries or joint ventures internationally. So quite a number of our bigger co-ops would have companies that they purchased in times past um, that they use to distribute products in, 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 in different countries. Um, so particularly our larger cooperatives also have their own routes to market, particularly for powder. Uh, and the third route for market is, is, is di direct relationships between our cooperatives and the infant formula companies. Um, infant formula is increasingly important to us. Uh, it's the most valuable export that we have after our Kerrygold butter. Um, but there's no Irish infant formula company. There's no Irish infant formula brand. So all of our mostly whey powders that, that, that leave as infant formula do so in somebody else's brand. And this is one of the challenges the Irish dairy industry has, which is um, 
do we actually want to create an Irish infant formula brand, um, maybe even use the Kerrygold brand to, 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 to sell Irish infant formula because the infant formula that the cans of infant formula that are sold internationally um, are just somebody else's brand and, and really the, the margin is owned by the private company that owns the brand, not by the Irish cooperatives. So that's a challenge that we have and we have to answer that question. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. Um, just in terms of our total food and drink exports then, so you can understand where we come from, we export at the moment about 12 billion euros because again, we have a small domestic, small domestic market, so we've got to ship. So our total food and drink exports are about 12 billion. Um, of that, um, international markets, 32%, uh, other EU market, markets, 35 um, except so, and, and, yeah, and 35 for the UK. So that's our total food and drink. So EU, UK, and world markets, about a third each. Uh, and these, of, of that 12 billion, about 30% is dairy, um, and meat and livestock is about 31%. So the areas that we're involved in, they're about 30%. So about 60% of that 12 billion comes from either dairy or, or mostly beef. Just a short word on, on the beef sector, because it's all private companies, no cooperatives. Uh, the beef sector in Ireland is about half of it comes from um, beef breeds of cows, so Charolais and Limousins um, 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 and Belgian Blues, uh, and half comes as byproducts of the dairy sector, so the, the, the beef, the, the bull calves of the dairy sector. So we would produce about 600,000 tonnes of beef. Um, so we're, we're, we're big beef exporters, but unfortunately half of that goes to the UK. Um, that's good at the moment because the UK is the highest paying um, European beef market, so if you're going to the market with the highest price, that's pretty good. But then if you get thrown out of that market, it's not very good. So um, we have some pretty severe worries at the moment on the beef side, uh, so it's very important to get a good Brexit deal. Um, and also, if we don't get a good Brexit deal, there's 300,000 tonnes of Irish beef going to find its way to supermarket shelves all over Europe uh, at a discounted price. So that's no good for anybody. So we, we need a good Brexit deal so as not to lose our biggest, our biggest customer. And our beef exports are about 2.5 billion, but all from private companies. And the one problem that our beef farmers would tell you is that the price isn't high enough and they're losing money and the farmers are entirely dependent on subsidies for their income. Um, so it's not a sustainable business. Uh, so that's the, I guess, the lesson from that sector, which has no cooperative control. Farmers are price takers, uh, and they don't have a sustainable business. On the dairy sector, which is co-op dominated, uh, we export about four billion. Um, 2017 had a 19% growth. Uh, about half that growth was in volume, and about half it was in, in price. So it's, 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 it's a good business. Uh, but again, our markets, about a quarter of, of all our dairy products go to the United Kingdom, Brexit concerns. Uh, about 30% go to the rest of the European Union, dominated by Germany. Uh, and close to 50% goes to non-EU markets. So we're selling more and more outside of the EU. Um, so China, you'll see if you can read that there, you can see our biggest customers are the UK, China, the Netherlands. I'd say you'd be surprised to hear, our Dutch friend would be surprised to hear that the Netherlands is our third biggest market, but that's a, that's a, a statistical glitch uh, when product is distributed via the Netherlands, uh, Germany and the United States. So those, those are the markets that we sell to on the dairy side. Just a comment on the farmer's position, because this is all about farmers. Cooperatives exist for farmers. Um, I constantly have to remind, I guess, our own people in Ireland about the fact that the farmer works for the cooperative, the, the cooperative doesn't work for the farmer, um, because I guess sometimes when, when cooperatives get big, and the comment was made earlier, the bigger the cooperative gets, sometimes it gets a little bit corporate, and the ordinary person who gets up in the morning to milk cows, it's a long way up to the boardroom, uh, and I think somehow, I was asked to mention for a while here, communications, sometimes the challenge when, you, when your cooperative gets bigger and bigger. You have several tiers of representation before you get to the board, and that's a challenge in a big cooperative. So the cooperative always needs to remember it works for the farmer, not the other way around. 
So just so you understand the farmer's position, Ireland, I said earlier, had about 70,000 square kilometres, which is about seven, 7 million hectares. I think the, 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 the maths are right. Um, that's in this part, the Republic of Ireland. There's about 1.4 million hectares in Northern Ireland, which is owned by the UK for now. Um, so of that 7 million hectares in, in the Republic of Ireland, about 64%, sort of two-thirds, is suitable for agriculture. Much of the rest of it is, is in mountains and, and rocky areas in the west coast. It's very, very wet and very, very windy. It's not very suitable for, for any kind of agriculture. Um, of our agricultural land, 81% uh, of it uh, is, for, is, is, is for productive grass, with another 11% what we call rough grazing. So not good grass, but grass. So it's probably about 92% of our agricultural land is grass, so it's grazing, and only 8% for crop production. So we have very, very small amount of cereals and, and horticulture, very, very little horticulture. Um, and of the total land area, about 10% is used for forestry. I think we have the lowest percentage forest cover, cover in Europe. Um, so uh, interestingly, Ireland, like lots of other countries, are challenged around greenhouse gas emissions and how we can mitigate our greenhouse gas production. And one of the arguments is that we should plant more forestry. But farmers in Ireland hate forestry. Because if you have your farm here and the farm next door is for sale and a forestry company buys it, then you can't buy it. And you can never buy it. It'll always be a forest. So far farmers in Ireland see forests as big walls that they can't get through. That's land that I will never be able to use. That's how they see forestry. So we have a cultural problem with forestry, so that's why we have so little of it. Um, we have about 100,000 farms in total, slightly over 100,000, with about 40 hectares each. That's kind of the, the, the median farm size. But of those 100,000 farms, there's only about 30,000 that are commercially viable. Um, the others, the other 70,000 farms, uh, aren't making a commercial income. Uh, they're they're semi-retired, they work part-time, maybe they're, they're men whose wife has a really good job and they're doing childcare at home and some farming, but their domestic circumstances are that they're not depending on farming for an income. They wouldn't want to be because they wouldn't make one. Um, just so you can understand again why we talk a lot about dairy in Ireland, if we look at our national farm survey, um, which is, does a survey of, of, of farmers' incomes, and this is 16 versus 17. Uh, in 2017, the average family farm income in dairying was 86,000 euros, um, and that's from around 40 hectares. So the incomes are quite good in dairying. That was the year before was, was, was uh, 16, which wasn't a good year. Uh, it was 52,000. We think in 2018, milk price isn't, isn't as good in 18, uh, and, the, and the costs were higher. Production was slightly higher, milk price was, slightly, was a little bit lower, and the costs were much higher due to the drought. We think that the dairy farm income this year will probably be somewhere around 60,000. So they don't become millionaires, but it's a good income. It's a good, sustainable family farm income for somebody with 40 hectares. So that's why we say dairying is where it's at. If you look at, this is tillage, this is cereal growing, um, it's 30 to 37,000. It's okay, it's fine, but it's probably not enough to, tr to attract the next generation. The next generation have lots of other options. Um, we, ha in, in, we have two cattle or beef type systems. One is called cattle other and the other is cattle rearing. So these are statistical categories, but their incomes are 16,000, 12,000, and in sheep, 15,000. So those are below what you'd call economically sustainable, uh, and they're more suited to non-full-time farming operations. So really, if we're looking at where's the future of Irish farming for the next generation, it's got to be dairy cows, because nothing else gives an, gives an income. And that's where our cooperatives are in this business. Um, a number of our cooperatives are in livestock trading, so selling live animals from one farm to another, or in farm services or farm supports, but not in the beef business. Just again, some of you can understand some of the economics of dairy farming in Ireland. So in 2017, the average dairy farm income was 86,000. Um, per cow, that was 1,136. 
euros per cow. So a good income per cow. It's an efficient system in Ireland. Um, the total milk price those years, 2015 was 31 cents, 2016 was 28 cents, 2017 was 37 cents, and these were the production costs, 22 and a half, 21.75, and 22.78. So those are the typical production costs from grass in Ireland. So these were the net margins achieved. So on 400,000 litres, that gives a reasonable income. Um, yeah, I'll pass on the rest. So grass is what makes our production system efficient. It's, it's what makes us stand out, and it's what makes the system sustainable. And it's around that business, it's around the grass production system that our co-ops have developed their business. I've just about five minutes left, so I'll move on. Just one, there was a, there was a question asked earlier um, about what's the best way to communicate between farmers, and I'll just address it now. Um, because in Ireland, the most efficient way that farmers have learned the skills to become efficient is through a, 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 a structure called discussion groups. So we have about 17,000 dairy farmers, and like every population, you have some really, really good, efficient ones, and you have a middle tier, and then you have some people that are less efficient and, and slower to, to, to adopt new technologies. But 6,000 of those farmers, the more efficient of our dairy farmers, 6,000 of them are in things called discussion groups. These are groups that actually started on farmers' own initiatives, but have subsequently, the system has been integrated into our rural development plan. So groups of farmers, typically between 12 and 20, form these discussion groups. They're either people that they are friends with, or farmers who are nearby or farmers who have a similar type of scale and structure, or farmers who have a, different, have a sim similar level of efficiency. But they're self-selected groups of 12 to 20. They have a facilitator, which is an advisor, who's either from the private sector or from the state advisory uh, services. Um, the discussion group members get a grant every year from the Rural Development Plan to pay for the services of their facilitator, who's an advisor, and they meet 12 times a year on, 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 on somebody else's farm. So this month they're on my farm, next month they're on somebody else's farm, and they discuss things. They have a professional in the room who's a facilitator. So in the summertime, maybe they're out looking at grass, in the wintertime they're inside drinking tea, chatting, but they spend a morning together every month, and they challenge each other. They go through, on the host farm, they go through all the statistics, how much grass are you growing, how much grass are you utilizing, what's the kilos of solids produced per cow per hectare, and all the KPIs, the key performance, performance indicators that are relevant to those farmers are discussed by those 12 to 15 people. And they challenge each other. Again, they're all peers. So you don't have one guy who's super and one guy who's not very good in the same room because they, they would have no empathy. They'd have no connection. But when you have 12 or 15 people who are very closely aligned, who have a degree of competitiveness, an interesting story would be that a dairy farmer would tell you, we have a system nationally in Ireland where every, every farm is inspected by the state services every 18 months. So we have this quality inspection, and farmers make sure the place is really clean and spotless and there's no rubbish anywhere. And, and if you talk to a farmer, you'd say, well, what's it like when you're getting ready for the inspection? And he says, yeah, yeah, I try to tidy the place up when I have the inspection, but I try harder to tidy it up when I have my discussion group. So the place is even cleaner when the discussion group comes, because that's just peer pressure. And that is the system that works very well for us. Uh, it's, so it's, it's peers, it's farmers, with a facilitator in the room that can verify figures and stats, etc. And they just, and they raise their own standard. Um, so anyway, a few issues that major challenges that our co-ops are facing, and maybe how we might address them as cooperatives. On the operation side of things, I mentioned earlier that we had a dramatic expansion in milk supply over the last three or four years. Uh, one of the big challenges was to provide sustainable expansion opportunities. Like, it's all very well to produce 50% more milk, but what are you going to do with 50% more milk? Where are you going to go? Every market that you're selling to is full. So you've got to find new markets with new products, and you have to get new factory capacity uh, to handle it. So going from 600 million litres in the busy months to a billion litres in the busy month. You need extra capacity. Uh, you, so we had to spend a billion euros in capacity 
we had to find markets for this product because no, none of our competitors in, 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 in European markets was going to let us um, take their market, and, and, that's, and that's correct. Uh, and we had to innovate. So that's a big challenge for cooperatives, uh, and that takes good governance and it takes sound structures. And the other one is to support members, uh, because members mostly are increasing in milk supply. They have to borrow more money, um, uh, and they have to learn new skills, and they have to become more resilient, and that's a challenge. And they also have to be profitable. The sustainability challenge is one that's particularly pertinent in Ireland um, because we're increasing in milk supply uh, and we will, we will really struggle to reach our greenhouse gas um, limits uh, as we increase our milk supply. Um, so we've put together a, a, um, a national sort of brand called Origin Green, which tries to focus farmers on reducing greenhouse gas and protecting water and air quality and on protecting habitats. So there is a massive amount of work going on currently in Ireland of inspections on farms and advice to farmers around mitigation, reduction of greenhouse gas production um, and improvements in air and water quality and soon to happen now work on, on protecting habitats. The volatility challenge that was mentioned earlier, um, in the real market we've been seeing prices ranging from close enough to 20 cents per litre to nearly 40 per cent per litre. And the normal family farm, which is, a, which is a, um, an unincorporated um, sole trader, it's almost impossible for them to survive that. So in order to, to, to survive that, the first thing that a farmer can do is, is, is just increase, increase efficiency at farm level, make more profit when the price is good. So the discussion groups I mentioned earlier are, are a key part of that. Moving up the value chain away from commodities and in towards infant formula and specialised nutrition, and developing tools like fixed price schemes. Uh, and this has been developed over the last five years in Ireland. The first co-op to do it was Glanbia, but now Ornua, which is the secondary cooperative, is, is making offerings available to the other cooperatives so that farmers can fix a milk price for a period between one year and, and generally three years. So the farmers made an offer, would you like to lock in 20%, 10% of your milk over this period? And the price offered is 31.7 cents a litre or whatever it is on the day. And I would say probably over 20% of our milk is currently in fixed price schemes um, so that farmers know what they're getting for that portion of their milk. Um, that's a key, uh, a key offering. Another challenge is around the policy side. I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the dairy economy is doing very well. And Dublin actually is a city. It's just like Tallinn. It's doing really well. But the rest of the rural economy is doing very badly. So we have a two-speed economy. So... It's a challenge for all of us to try to figure out how do we address rural decline for those people that aren't dairy farmers. 70% um, of farmers aren't economically sustainable. Dairy incomes are very good, but ordinary farmer incomes are very poor. And we need to attract a new generation of farmers. The average age is 57. Um, there are lots of young people coming into dairying, but there's no young people coming into the, the beef sector, which isn't sustainable. So we need to figure that one out. Um, this is just to, uh, uh, to capture some of the services that the co-ops provide. Our dairy farms are smaller than yours, so there are 80 cows. So somebody with 80 cows, it, it's a small business, um, and they don't have access to a lot of specialist expertise unless we can put it in place. So these are some of the structures that, that, that our cooperatives have put in place around the farmers. IFAC is a farm accountancy cooperative. Um, Milkflex is a, is a low-cost credit system provided by the cooperatives and a, a non-bank lender. IMQCS is a cooperative that trains milking machine technicians to make sure that they do their job right. I discussed the fixed milk price schemes. Chagask is the state advisory service, but all the cooperatives run joint programs with Chagask, with the state advisory service, to provide good, cheap advice, good free advice to dairy farmers. Origin Green is our environmental sustainability initiative. We have cattle breeding companies that are owned by the cooperatives to make sure that the best genetics are available, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and just before I finish up, Brexit is the, the big challenge that we face. I read on Twitter today that we may have a solution. I don't know. We're losing a very important market, 37% of our food and drink, half our beef, a third of our dairy, over half our cheese. Well, we could have substantial additional costs and tariffs and a big drop in the UK pound. Um, 
That's what the Northern Ireland border looks like at the minute with holes in it. If we were to put up cameras, it would look worse. Uh, the border is 500 kilometres long. It's got 275 crossings. Apparently, there's only 137 in, in all of Europe's eastern border. So that is a big problem. Uh, that's what it used to look like. In summary, we have a lot of challenges, but we're very confident. Thank you. of milk products abroad, you can make very good profit, it's e efficient, and it's a very good example, of course, for, for us also, how, how to do, because we should export 50%. Uh, my question to you is, my question to you is, Now is in the world globalization and the world is smaller and smaller and some companies have started to think about uh, cross-border co-ops already. What do you think? When comes time when ICOS is taking members from East Europe, for example? Um, well, I, I cast wouldn't, but it w w would an Irish cooperative look to become um, cross-border? Well, with, they are cross-border already in that they have members in Northern Ireland, so three or four of our cooperatives have members in Northern Ireland, so Ireland as an island is, is, is one dairy economy, even though there's two political jurisdictions. The only concern, when I look at um, sort of cross-border or large cooperatives, I look at somewhere like Arla, um, and they're a very professional organisation, do their business very well, but I just see so many tensions within that organization by virtue of geography. Um, they have producers in the Arctic Circle producing milk extraordinarily ex in a very expensive system, and they have producers down the southwest of the UK producing milk as cheaply as Ireland, and they all get the same milk price. Um, I just ca I don't see how it works. Um, and as cooperatives get bigger and bigger, like ICOS is in favour of consolidation, but the big challenge is as the cooperative gets bigger and bigger, the farmers get further and further from the decision making, and that's a huge challenge. Thank you. Kas meil on saalist esinejale küsimusi? Palun, tõstke käsi, kes soovib. Hello, everybody. My name is Roman. I am from Ukraine. I represent the Coop Academy. It's a education part of Extension Service, Dnipro Extension Service. We have uh, actually five questions for each um, speakers, but for you, six. And I would like to ask one. You say about a uh, big uh, season of milk in the summertime. We have the same situation. Uh, what happens with employers in winter time? I mean, uh, in processors, uh, should be the same amount of employers all years. But in summer time, it's more rush, more people. In winter time, it should be less people. What happens with uh, people and how it's organized in uh, Irish? It's clear? It, yeah, yeah, it's clear. Uh, it, it depends on the employees. Um, so. The management team are needed all year round. The marketing team are needed, needed all year round. The quality team are needed all year round. Uh, the maintenance team are busier in the winter time, um, not in the summer time because there's no time for maintenance. So it, there, there, there are some employees uh, who go on what we call short time in the winter. So they, they're off for a number of months in the winter. And uh, for those people, it suits them, people who have done it for 30 years that work lots and lots and lots of hours in the summertime and get lots of overtime, and in the winter they're off and they do something else. So there are some employees, for, but like all of our factories, they all have unions, and the employees are very well represented. So these are systems that work for them. Thank you. Now we have a 
koofipausiks ja me oleme koofipausilt siin tagasi 14.50. Kõik slaidid, mida te täna nägite inglise keeles, need pannakse ühistegevuse pikaalise programmi kodulehele üles eesti keelsetena. Ja täna me meie praegust esinejad ka kingitusega DJ Lanigen. Thank you very much.